Hey everyone, this is Nick and oh boy it's been a mixed bag of good and bad news this week. Because on the one hand we have research proving that Windows 11 sends data to third parties without user consent right after the install and we have an AI tool that uses GPL licensed code without redistributing anything or respecting attribution. But on the other hand we have Fedora actually moving to full on flat hub and we have performance improvements coming to GNOME software soon, and we have some more details about Thunderbird's development roadmap. So, should I be happy or worried? And should you be happy to see this segue to today's sponsor? This video is sponsored by Linode. Linode is the only solution I use to run my own Nextcloud server and my only Office server as well. It's a super easy solution to deploy basically anything you want in one click. They have a huge marketplace of applications you can host, from Nextcloud, WordPress, Drupal, GitLab or Grafana, to gaming servers for Minecraft, Arc, CSGO, Rust, Valheim and more. They take care of all the configuration for you. All you have to do is click the thing you want to deploy, fill in a few details and your server is up and running. And once everything is live, it's still super easy to manage your servers, to upgrade or downgrade them, add some storage, back them up, and get help if you're stuck. I've been using Linode for years now, and I can only recommend them. If you want to give them a shot, click the link in the description below, and you'll get $100 of free credit to get started. So, if there was still any doubt, it's now confirmed that Windows 11 is basically spyware. A recent video from the PC Security Channel on YouTube shows that the latest versions of Windows 11 reach out to third-party servers right after the first boot, without asking for any user permission. Using Wireshark to analyze the DNS traffic, they found out that Windows 11 connects to MSN, Bing and Windows Update immediately after boot, but it also reaches out to third parties like Steam, McAfee or Comscore Market Research, even on a fresh install. All these requests provide telemetry data to various advertising companies, market researchers and even geolocation domains, without any permission or even without opening a web browser. The same channel tried Windows XP as a comparison point and found that it only calls to Windows Update and nothing else. Now, granted, that OS was introduced in 2001 and at the time, user data wasn't remotely as valuable as today, but it still shows a worrying trend. When the biggest operating system on earth is as careless of user preferences or consent and decides to supply third parties with data without the user's knowledge, you know something is truly rotten. Compounded with the various ads that Microsoft adds in its default experience, from the start menu to the news widget overlay, the lock screen, the search tool, or even the file explorer, it's clear that the focus of Windows isn't to provide the user with a tool to actually use their computer, but to extract as much data and money out of them as possible. And if you're watching this, chances are you're actually using Linux, which means that you're not affected by this. And it's nice to have that reassurance that our choice was the right one. But also, if you were not already using Linux, well, that's another argument for you to make the switch. Finally, Fedora is embracing Flatpak and Flathub fully. While the distro was always at the forefront of Flatpak usage, pushing it early on, they had decided to stick to their own remote by default that only offered a subset of the apps available on Flathub. Well, these days will end with Fedora 38, which will offer full Flathub as a third-party remote that users can enable just as easily as they enabled Fedora's remote. The proposal was actually made earlier for Fedora 37, but had been rejected at the time by the Fedora Steering Committee. This means that Fedora users, as long as they enable third-party remotes in the first run setup of GNOME or in GNOME software after install, will get access to the full breadth of Flathub without having to add it manually themselves. It wasn't a difficult step by any means, as you could just download any app from Flathub's website and double-click it to install it, and the remote would be added automatically. But it was still a potential confusion source for users who aren't familiar with Flatpak. So it's great to see it resolved. Flathub currently has about 2000 applications available, including the most popular ones like GIMP, LibreOffice, Firefox, and more. And now if all distros could follow suit, then we could have a truly great and easy app install experience for everyone. 
and maybe the last kinks in Flatpak software could be handled faster. And yes, I'm looking at you, Elementor iOS. No, your little description text on the onboarding app and the app center isn't enough. You need a toggle for people to actually enable Flathub in one click. A developer found that an AI tool called voice.ai used open source libraries without respecting their licenses, namely the GPL version 3 and the LGPL version 2.1. It looks like the tool uses code from Pratt, an open source speech analysis software, to build their real-time voice synthesizer. They also use libgcrypt, but in both instances, they don't release the source code of the modifications they built on top of it, or of any part of their software, and they don't follow attribution in any file or dialogue in the application. They even actively prevent transferring the code or the product to anyone in their licensing terms. The developer who found out about this has a blog post in which they explain how they uncovered this violation using reverse engineering tools and looking for references to specific strings used in the open source libraries they used. The developer then reached out to the tool's Discord for an explanation and were banned from it shortly after without warning for talking about reverse engineering. The company since answered and put out a pretty self-contradictory statement saying that they do not violate open source licenses, but at the same time that yes, they do use these open source libraries, which clearly means that they do violate the licenses since they didn't follow them at all after including this software in their code. They said they will make the relevant source code available in their GitHub repo and that they have since removed all GPL v3 code from their software, but that still doesn't fix the issue. According to the licenses, they have to release the source code for their tool up to the version before they removed GPL v3 code, something I am pretty certain they won't do judging from their reaction. And sure, the fact that it's an AI tool isn't really relevant, it's just another startup that decided to use open source code without respecting the licenses. But it still shows a general pattern of AI related tools that they generally don't really have any regard for the license of the content they use, either to train their model or to build their own tools. Now, if you use GNOME, you might have noticed that the GNOME software app can sometimes be pretty slow to display stuff, especially when listing apps in a category. Well, there's good news, as the prolific George Stavrakas has spent some time profiling the app to see what was taking so long to load. Using Sysprof, a nice graphical profiling tool, they discovered that an operation took more than four seconds to execute. And this operation is the one used to list the applications in a specific category in GNOME software. Looking into it, they found out that loading app icons was the culprit here, because some apps declare remote icons that then have to be downloaded from Flathub, for example. But some apps have invalid URLs for these icons, which means that GNOME software might wait for a while before displaying anything. So the developers quickly found a fix by using a cache for app icons and by displaying things even without having everything ready and queuing up the downloads in the background. George published a quick video showing the difference before and after the fix, and it's night and day, with the new version taking less than half the time of the old one to display the same elements. So let's hope that this profiling work will make it to other GNOME applications so we can have the zippiest experience possible. If, like me, you haven't been able to use Thunderbird because of its dated interface and convoluted user experience, then here's an interesting read. In a blog post, their product design manager explained the history of the project and their plans for the future to rebuild Thunderbird from the ground up, bit by bit. Their goal is to get rid of technical and UI debt that they accumulated over the past 10 years. Alex goes over the history of Thunderbird, explaining how it was created by reusing the code of Firefox, then how it was moved to a community-driven model as the Mozilla Foundation stopped working on it. While this generated a lot of user funding that allowed Thunderbird to keep going, as well as a lot of contributions to the project, it also made this project complex to manage and coordinate as it moved from one development model to another. This resulted in an inconsistent user interface and difficulties to build and release Thunderbird, as coordination with the Firefox development efforts was lost. Nowadays, Thunderbird has more paid employees working on the project, being owned by a subsidiary of Mozilla. And this meant that while Thunderbird is still open source with an open development model, 
code and changes are now approved by core developers and designers, which means that some contributions might be rejected if they are not up to snuff. Now, with Thunderbird being sustainable, they are focusing on removing technical debt and rebuilding each module in turn to have a better experience all around. The first visible results will be in version 115 in July that will bring a simple and clean user interface with customization options so long-time Thunderbird users can keep their workflows. And they will keep at it for the next two years, focusing on usability and accessibility. And it's wonderful to see, because Thunderbird is basically one of the most powerful contact, calendar, RSS, the personal information management suite that we all want on Linux. But its current interface doesn't let it reach its true potential. So if they can manage to have something simpler for people who want a simpler experience while keeping all the power under there, I think they'll have a winner. Now let's take a quick look at what's been brewing in the GNOME world. First, GNOME Builder, the IDE to build GNOME apps, uses more up-to-date GDK4 widgets, which enables them to also have drag and drop in the project tree. Global Search was also improved to support filtering and previewing of search results. Loop, the new image viewer, has now been accepted in the GNOME Incubator program, which is basically the process that lets apps become GNOME core applications that might be shipped by default with every version of GNOME. This new viewer also got swipe gestures to navigate between images, a revamped image browsing code to fix some bugs, and support for moving images to the trash. Warp, the computer-to-computer -computer file transfer app, got a new release with QR code support to let you transfer files easily, and they also have an experimental Windows version so it supports more devices. There's also a new iPlan application in the works, which is basically a to-do list app with support for projects, boards, and more. It's too early to say how well it works, but since I'm a sucker for new productivity tools, I will give it a shot as soon as it has a stable release out. There's also Design, a new 2D CAD application that was released. It supports the DXF format, uses common workflows that other CAD apps traditionally use. It lets you use the command line or a toolbar to draw and manipulate your drawing. It has layer management and it has support for entities that you can look at and modify. I think it's interesting to see a CAD tool coming to GNOME, because GNOME has traditionally been home to more simple applications with one very small simple purpose. And this kind of app is kind of more complex, so I think maybe with libadvita and a more unified development environment, developers are now tackling bigger and more complex projects. And as for KDE, the team has added the ability to define your default apps for a lot more file types straight from the settings. The accent color UI has been condensed, so it uses less screen space, which should let developers add day or night color scheme switching in Plasma 6. The on-screen display that shows the current audio device being used also shows the battery level now. Visual glitches have been fixed in the corners of various frames across multiple applications, and they fixed 108 bugs across the whole project. Now, all these changes will make it to Plasma 6, as we are way too close to Plasma 5.27's release date in just three days. And of course, stay tuned and subscribe to the channel if you want to see my review of that new release, which should be a big one, seeing as it's going to be the last KDE Plasma release for version 5. And let's finish this with the gaming news. It looks like ray tracing on Linux is going to improve in the future, as the Vulkan beta drivers for NVIDIA GPUs are now adding support for a new Vulkan extension, affectionately named VKX Pipeline Library Group Handles, which basically improves compatibility with certain DirectX ray tracing calls. Proton still needs to make use of that new extension, and for now only the NVIDIA beta drivers have it, where Mesa, used for AMD and Intel, doesn't. But it's still good news for people who want to halve their performance for some pretty sunlights. And if you bought the lower storage capacity Steam Deck and you feel that the performance penalty using an SD card is still too big, you might be happy to learn that you will now be able to easily buy replacement SSDs, up to 2 terabytes for your Steam Deck, from Framework. That company makes the very well-reviewed Framework laptop, but it looks like they want to expand their general vision to other consumer products, which is great, especially since finding compatible SSDs for the deck can be tricky, as it uses a small, uncommon SSD format. Imagine how cool it would be to have Framework become the powerhouse company that provides replacement parts and upgrades for a variety of consumer devices. That would be pretty awesome. 
Awesome? Like today's sponsor! If you're in the market for a new computer and you plan to run Linux on it, maybe it's time to stop buying Windows devices, crossing your fingers and praying that everything runs smoothly. Maybe it's time to buy a computer that's actually been designed to run Linux from today's sponsor, Tuxedo. They're based in Germany, but they ship worldwide and they have a big range of devices that honestly should suit every price point and every need. They have laptops and desktops, they have affordable ones and pricier ones, they have super simple ones and very powerful ones for gaming, for work, for workstations. You decide and they are all super customizable with various options. They are all repairable and upgradable and you can have your own logo engraved on the lid of your laptop or no logo at all if you don't like branding. And you can also have your own custom keyboard layout laser etched on the keys. So if you need a new device, you want to support Linux's development and you want to run Linux on that device, well, click the link in the description below and check out Tuxedo's products. They're really good. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications and to write a comment. And if you didn't like it, there's also the dislike button. You can't see how many people clicked on it unless you have an extension, but it still works. And if you really enjoy what I do and you want to support the channel, well, there are plenty of links down there in the description. From super thanks on YouTube to PayPal to Patreon subscribers or YouTube members and the audio version of that podcast, which you can also support on Patreon. So if you want to know more about what I do, my website, anything else, check those links out. In the meantime, thank you all for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.